Hi, everyone. Um, thank you so much for tuning back into our GI Onc 101 series. Uh, my name is Nina Sanford from UT Southwestern Dallas, Texas. Um, today, we will be talking about anal cancer. So I think probably of all the GI subsites, anal cancer receives the least amount of attention. Um, several reasons for that. One is that it's, it's just a more rare cancer, although the incidence is increasing. Um, but important to remember that most patients with anal cancer have curable disease. So it's important that we optimize treatment so that anyone who can be cured is cured or has the best chance at cure. Um, and then also for all patients, um, treatments are done the best they can to minimize acute and really late toxicities. Let's go ahead and get started. Okay. So starting with diagnosis, most of these are either found um, for a patient getting surveillance if they're high risk, if they have history of condylomas, or if the patient reports symptoms, either bleeding, pain, or they notice um, a protruding mass or something like that. Um, the most common histology is a squamous cell carcinoma. Um, if you see an adenocarcinoma on biopsy, then you want to treat as a rectal cancer. Conversely, if you see a squamous cell carcinoma in the rectum, you treat as an anal cancer. So really, the histology determines the treatment um, with regards to squamous versus adenocarcinoma. If you have an anal melanoma, which is more rare, then the paradigm is different. You want to treat as a melanoma. Typically, they start with immunotherapy. 85% are HPV positive, um, but in 2025, the treatment is the same regardless of HPV status, unlike for head and neck squamous cell cancers. Uh, what do you want for imaging? So we do a baseline PET with diagnostic CT. Um, I find that a PET is important for both initial staging and response assessment. Um, a CT is also acceptable. And then sometimes for small tumors, um, if it's not well seen on the PET, an MR can be helpful. You want to get HIV testing because HIV is a risk factor for, risk factor for anal cancer, although um, it's not considered an AIDS-defining illness. And then if a patient is HIV be positive, you want to check their CD4. Generally, if the CD4 count is upwards of two to 400, um, they're taking their antiretrovirals, the treatment is not, is not different. Uh, you want to check a CBC. So in anal cancer, the physical exam really is very important. So I'm not like a stickler with physical exams with my residents. I'm not asking them to report on like tactile fremitus, or if they have heard, uh, what's that called? Whispering, um, whispering pe pectoriloquy. Um, but in anal cancer, you have to examine the patient to make sure you're covering what you need to cover in the treatment uh, field and also to assess response to chemo radiation. Um, you want to ensure that women get a gyne gynecologic exam, um, that both genders get for, uh, fertility screening or counseling, if that's something that is of importance to the patient. Um, and then as I alluded to, anal cancer is technically considered a rare cancer with about 10 and a half thousand cases annually in the United States, um, but the incidence is increasing. Um, and who do you see it in? So generally in two populations. One is in older women. Um, this is sort of a chronic inflammation phenotype. They may have a history of lichen sclerosis. Um, and then the other is younger patients. Um, and risk factors would be being HIV positive, um, receptive anal intercourse, and then immunosuppression, whether that's from medications or uh, post-transplant would be the most common. Let's get into treatment. So the most common treatment would be definitive chemo radiation. And that is for anyone who's T2 to T4, node positive, um, M0, basically anyone who doesn't qualify for local excision, which I'll talk about more next, or patients with metastatic cancer who receive chemotherapy first. Um, the radiation dose, and I go into more detail about this later, um, depends on the stage. So for T2 to uh, T2 and 0, they go to 50.4 gray. Um, for T3 to 4 or node positive, the dose is higher to 54 gray. Chemotherapy standard is mitomycin C and 5-FU or CAPE. The dosages are listed here. Um, cisplatin instead of mitomycin C is category 2B in the NCCN. I'll talk more about the studies on that later, but you might want to consider it in patients with immunosuppression since we know that mitomycin is myelosuppressive. What about adjuvant immunotherapy? So there was a study looking at adjuvant nivolumab um, after chemoradiation, an ECOG trial that's completed accrual, but um, as far as I know, we don't have the results yet. Um, what about follow-up? So this is super important in anal cancer to assess response. So here's what I do. Two weeks after chemoradiation, for patients who 
had a tough time with treatment. They had a, a lot of toxicities, uh, dermatitis, um, diarrhea. I do a symptom check just to make sure that things are heading in the right direction. Um, usually that's just an external skin exam. At 10 to 12 weeks, about three months, that is the first time I do a DRE plus imaging. And here I do prefer a PET, um, though you may need to get a CT or MR depending on your insurance approval. By this time, the tumor really should be responding um, by a lot. Um, you definitely want to see a good clinical response by this time. Um, that being said, the decision point for whether or not a patient has a complete response or not is at six months when you do another DRE and imaging usually a CT scan. If they have a complete response, I generally follow every six months with exam and imaging for three years and annually up to five, though I tailor that based on my index of suspicion or if there's anything I'm really following. Um, if they do not have a complete response at six months, then you need to do additional treatment. You want to restage if they have persistent disease locally only, then the um, standard of care is salvage APR. Um, of course, if they um, develop systemic uh, progression, then they need uh, systemic therapy. All right. Um, let's talk about local excision. This is a little bit more nuanced. Um, so the way I think about it, there are really three scenarios for which local excision may be appropriate. So the first is for the so-called superficially invasive anal canal squamous cell cancer. These are um, cells that have not invaded the basement mem memory. This is something they can see on pathology. This is typically found incidentally. So a patient's getting um, an excision, um, a fulguration um, of what's thought to be a condyloma or a hemorrhoid or a biopsy. Um, Often it's in patients who are HIV positive, they have H-cell, they can be multifocal. Um, and sometimes depending on the procedure they had, specifically a fulguration, you can't really evaluate margins. But if the, um, if the cancer is felt to be superficially invasive, then uh, local excision alone followed by surveillance is an option. So I always counsel the patient that they may be at, they're probably at higher risk and there's a high chance that at some point they'll need definitive chemo radiation but that can probably be delayed without, um, without worsening their, um, their, their survival. The second scenario is for anal margin or perianal cancer. So what are they? These are tumors that are located distal to the anal verge, but within five centimeters. So like can't be something like on the thigh. It has to be within five centimeters. Um, if you have an anal margin or perianal cancer, if it's T1, maybe a small T2, and zero grade one to two, no involvement of the sphincter and excise with an adequate, this means a one centimeter margin, then surveillance is an option. Everything else, and I list here, then the standard of care is definitive chemo radiation, as I talked about before. And then the third scenario is that in the chance that you have a T1 N0 invasive cancer, but you are able to actually excise it with a wide negative margin, this is in the anal canal, you get a wide margin, their, uh, their function isn't compromised, um, they should get staging workup, but if all is negative, then observation is an option as well. All right, what else should you know about anal cancer? So let's talk about stage four. So fortunately, the majority of patients do not present with metastases at diagnosis, only about 10 to 20%. Um, though obviously some will develop METs in the future. Um, what is first-line chemotherapy? It's carbotaxel. Uh, what about immunotherapy? So currently it is category 2B in the NCCN. Um, there was a trial presented at ESMO, um, I think last year, um, with an iode agent that um, is very hard to pronounce, retifanlimab, um, that showed promising results, but other IO trials have been negative. Um, there is an ECOG trial that has finished accrual, so IO may have a more standard roll down the line, depending on the results of that. Um, second line is IO now, if not used previously, otherwise full box is an option. What about the role of radiation for stage four? So this is really, in my mind, a case-for-case -case basis, depending on the patient's symptoms um, and then the burden of disease. So if they have a big symptomatic primary tumor and a small met or vice versa, but generally we start with systemic therapy um, and consider consolidating with chemo radiation. All right, you need to know about toxicity management, particularly if you're a radiation oncologist. Um, patients should be counseled before starting treatment that they can have and are really expected to have pretty significant acute toxicity um, and potential for late toxicity as well. But as I'll talk about, some of those late toxicities can be mitigated. 
So what do you expect during treatment? Um, diarrhea, radiation, dermatitis are the most common. Um, I tell patients that these usually peak around the fourth, fifth week and last and are most severe for about a week or two after, then get better quickly as well. Um, in women, it is super, super important to emphasize the use of a vaginal dilator to prevent, really prevent, um, vaginal stenosis stricture and shortening. Um, we give that to patients after treatment. Some institutions also use it during radiation to decrease dose to the, um, to the vagina during treatment. Um, people ask about incontinence. So what I say that is that radiation itself is unlikely to cause incontinence because the dose we go to is lower than the tolerance of the nerves for, for most patients. But if you have baseline incontinence because the tumor has eroded through your sphincter muscles, um, then um, that, may, that may be permanent. That radiation may not reverse that even if the tumor is gone. Um, I find that pelvic physical therapy can be also very helpful for patients. Um, what about ctDNA? So this has obviously a hot topic across all GI cancers. There is emerging data for the role of ctDNA in anal cancer as well. Um, I think the best data thus far is from a group at MD Anderson that showed that HPV, uh, positive HPV ctDNA at three months was predictive of recurrence and worse survival. We don't know um, whether or not it's predictive of, sorry, prognostic. Uh, we don't know if it's predictive of response to treatment yet. Um, but that being said, I think um, down the line, as we have more studies, ctDNA will have a role in earlier response assessment and surveillance. All right, um, I wanted to talk about some of the important trials in anal cancer um, that really define our treatment today. So one you probably heard about, um, I'm sure is the original Niagara-Wayne State trial, um, 1974. Um, this was chemorabs with 5 fu and mitomycin, radiation was 30 gray. Um, the first published series only had three patients, but all three had a clinical complete response. After 1974, there were basically several trials um, that looked at a few things. Um, whether chemo was needed at all, so can we take out chemotherapy? Um, can we change chemotherapy from mitomycin to other regimens since mitomycin is not used a lot in oncology? Um, and also the role of induction or adjuvant chemo. I'll talk a little bit more about some of these, but they were essentially negative. So the current standard of care is really back to where we started, chemo radiation with MMC and 5-FU. Um, I want to talk about the ACT-2 trial. That was a phase three randomized trial, two by two trial, looking at cis versus mitomycin, maintenance versus no chemotherapy. Uh, the main important finding is not necessarily the chemo result, but that um, this trial showed that we can wait six months um, to allow for patients who have a CR, because about two thirds of patients who didn't have a CR at three months when you waited to six months, they did. Um, it also showed non-inferiority of cis, which is why some institutions continue to use that regimen. Um, what about RTOG 0529? So this was a phase two single arm trial to assess whether IMRT intensity modulated radiation therapy could reduce toxicity compared to historical controls. The primary endpoint was grade two plus GI or GU acute toxicity, which actually was not met. But as you can see, I wrote here that other toxicities were decreased. The one could argue, you know, the validity of comparing his historical controls. But that being said, um, I, IMRT with 052 dosing has really become a standard of care. All right, um, I want to talk about some ongoing trials. And really the theme of all these studies is that treatment for anal cancer should not be one size fits all because with that, you're probably over treating early stage patients and under treating um, patients with more advanced disease. So let me talk about three of them. Um, it's some of them I mentioned a little bit as well. So the decreased trial, um, this is a uh, North American Co-op group trial, it looks at radiation, uh, and chemo de-escalation for early stage less than 4 cm tumors. Um, so the dose is listed in the schema on the right. So if you're a T1, you get 36 gray, T2, you get 41.4. That is lower than the current standard 50.4 gray. Um, the field is also dropped to the superior border of, um, sorry, the bottom of the SI joint um, as opposed to L5S1. And then both arms get one cycle of mitomycin and the experimental arm gets one cycle of five of you. Um, primary endpoints are two-year disease control and quality of life. This is finished accruing. It's not yet reported. The PLATO trial is a trial done in Europe. Um, it stands for personalizing radiotherapy dose for anal cancer. There are three parts to it. Um, the first one you can see on the left is for early stage cancers, rec uh, 
uh, anal margin uh, tumors, uh, randomizing to either observation or adjuvant radiation um, if, um, if for a close margin. Uh, my understanding is that has not been reported yet. Um, the trial in the middle is actually very similar to the decreased trial, uh, lower dose for early stage anal cancers. Um, and my understanding is that complete response rates were about 90% in both arms um, and less toxicity in the lower dose, but we don't have longer term, term oncologic outcomes yet. And then the trial on the right is uh, dose escalation for more advanced tumors. Um, and I believe toxicity is just reported um, for these for that trial. So uh, much more to come with regards to the results from the PLATO trials. I mentioned adjuvant nivolumab. This is uh, ECOG 2165. Um, hopefully we'll get a result of that in the next coming years. There are also two smaller trials, uh, about just 50 patients assessing uh, both consolidation and concurrent immunotherapy that have not yet been reported. All right, last slide, um, as I tend to put this at the end, which is radiation planning. So what do you need to know about radiation planning for anal cancer? So you wanna give IV and PO contrast. These patients are supine, you're frog leg, uh, typically frog leg, you wanna bladder fill to reduce dose of the small bowel. If they have extension of tumor onto the skin, um, then you want to consider bolusing to make sure they get enough dose there. Um, I mentioned vaginal dilators some institutions use um, during treatment. And then um, it's important for the external component to also wire anything so you can make sure to see it on your CT simulation. Um, what dose to use? So from 0529 for T2N0, um, the high dose is at 50.4 and the elective dose is 42. 28 fractions. If you're T3 or, or T4 or node positive, then the gross tumor, the high dose goes to 54 gray as do nodes more than 3 cm. Uh, if your node is less than 3 cm, you go to 50.4 and the elective goes to 45. And then I'll just add that sometimes I do plan to give a four gray two times two boost for larger tumors. Um, I'll plan for it and then give it depending on how the patient's doing for treatment. What are your target volumes? So you can see um, the pictures here where I try to kind of point out all these different nodal beds, but um, what is your boost volume? The high dose, obviously the gross tumor, the anal canal, I do extend into the ischiorectal fossa. You can see in the first picture um, and I include the bottom couple centimeters of the mesorectum as well. Um, the lower dose elective volume, um, you wanna make sure to include the inguinal nodes. Those are first echelon particularly for tumors that um, start below the dentate line. Um, and then other nodal volumes would be, of course, the mesorectum for perirectal nodes, presacral, internal, and external iliac, and the obturator nodes. So that's anal cancer planning. All right, I think we're at uh, 16 minutes. Um, that's all I have for anal cancer. Um, I hope you found that helpful, and um, feel free to let me know if you have any questions. Thank you.